This video is an introduction to deep neural networks. I will give you a mathematically fairly rigorous explanation of how these things work, but it's still an explanation that anybody can understand. So if you forgot all your calculus and barely know what matrix algebra is, uh, this will still be satisfying. Then I want to show you how simple this is by actually building one in base R with just 15 to 20 lines of code. So this is also very satisfying to see that you can do this. But then for applications, we do rely on packages. So we'll install TensorFlow GPU. That's the graphics card accelerated version of Google's machine learning platform. And with that, we move on to a lab where you can try your hand at solving environmental science problems with deep neural networks. So you can practice to apply different architectures to solve different problems. Now, even though this is primarily for an environmental science audience, I do want to start with a classic machine learning problem, which is image recognition. So what we're using here is the MNIST database of 60,000 images of handwritten characters. And you can see many of them are nicely readable, but uh, there's also some odd ones here, this four or this two. Computers have trouble with those kind of things. But we're going to train a neural network to do this. And to help with this, these images have all been labeled. A human has previously looked at them, said that this is a four, this is a two, and then we can train the neural network to recognize these things. Now, the way this works is we're basically feeding all the 60,000 images one by one, minus the label, through the network. The images are 28 times 28 pixels, so that's 784 pixels. So we need 784 input neurons. You can think of this as your visual cortex. Then we have 16 processing neurons here. So even though that's a very bare bones processing architecture, we already now have 12,500 dendrites that we need to connect every pixel to every processing neuron. And then we have 10 output neurons. So that's just 160 connections. And what happens during the training is that the dendrites get weighted. So we can say, okay, this first one here may not be an important input neuron. We'll turn that off. But other pixels are important. We need them to recognize particular digits. So what we want in the end is that we feed all the pixel values into the neural network. And if it was a four, then we want that fourth output neuron to light up and tell us that's a four. So to motivate my lecture, mm, take me about 30 minutes to explain all the ideas and math that's behind it. I just want to show you the simplicity and power of these neural networks. So that's R code that does exactly what I've shown you on the previous slide. So we'll import the database here. Let's see how long this takes. I put a little timer on there. So it's not a huge database, but this is also a pretty old Surface laptop. So it took 12 seconds uh, to bring that in. And you can see we have in the first column the label, and then this database is already arranged so that a neural network can read it. So all the pixels are basically in a, in a very long row. So we have 60,000 rows and 584 pixels plus one label. That's our columns. And so we have to do a little bit of data preparation here. So that basically just separates the labels from my pixels. We have to define a few functions and uh, then define our architecture. We have these 784 times 16 neurons and then 16 times 10, just as I explained in the previous slide. And now we can train this thing. And this is essentially the entire code that will execute my neural network training. So I wonder if you can guess how long it will take for the neural network to understand this database. So we'll only go through that database once, but we'll look at every single image. We'll calculate weights to correctly classify each image. And then every 32 images, we update the weights to get a final trained network. So it took 12 seconds to load the database. So now let's see how long it will take to train it. So in two and a half seconds, it made a gazillion weight adjustments and learned how to classify handwritten images. Now, I tell you this, but we obviously need to validate it. So for this, we have a separate test data set here. And let's run this little bit of code as well. So it's 10,000 images and we get 92% accuracy. That's pretty great. And if you think about it, what we just did, we trained a neural network based on 60,000 images. And that took two and a half seconds 
and then we let it classify another 10,000 and there was virtually no delay, right? That happened in the blink of an eye. That was like a tenth of a second, 10,000 images done. So you can see that this is a game changer and this is really what's at the heart of every AI application. Now, you may say, Andreas, you're overstating the case a little bit. What we are looking at here, this puny image recognition program, that's not quite AI. You know, AI has other qualities to it. There must be other stuff going on. But let me give you an example of how sophisticated AI works. So one thing we can obviously do, we can turn our training around. So we looked at predicting a label from an image. But we can also train it the other way around, right? We can give it a label and train it to make an image. And examples that are really quite impressive for this is for DALI or stable diffusion. So most people would agree that that's AI. So what you do, you feed it a large number of images that are labeled and just add stepwise noise. Um, and then you train our little neural networks uh, to denoise this from pure static back to a lion. So a single neural net cannot do this in one step, but if you string a bunch of them together, then you can actually give it a prompt and it will construct an image stepwise based on the millions of inputs that you get. And so once you have this series of networks trained, uh, then you can go and give it crazy prompts. Give me a flamingo lion, give me cows grazing on the moon, uh, give me frogs on stilts, and it is able to do these kind of things. And so what's in those little boxes is exactly that code. It has to be that code. This has to be incredibly efficient. And, and so this is what this little black box does. But it is not a black box. So you can fully understand what's exactly going on mathematically in this code. And that's what I'm going to explain to you next. So what do deep neural networks do? They predict y from x. That's all. And that's, of course, something we are very familiar with. If you took my undergraduate class, you know what a linear regression is. We can also do a multiple regression. So in this case, I have two predictor variables for one response variable, and I can also have curvilinear relationships between predictor and response variables. And so whatever DNNs do, it boils down to this functionality. And just to give you an example, if you want to program a self-driving car, you might want to know how hard do I need to hit the brakes, so that would be my Y variable, given video feeds from camera X1 and camera X2. And all machine learning algorithms, they learn from data, so my data is here represented as red dots. So you can think of this as what drivers have done in the past under certain situations. And then I'm going to try to fit a surface to this and predict what I should do given past behavior. So uh, let's see how this core functionality works. So I'm trying to think of this as Lego blocks from which we can build a complex neural network. So my most basic building blocks are neurons. And it's actually a really nice analogy. Um, let's start with just two neurons that are connected by some dendrites. And in the middle, they have a synapse that allows them to communicate. And so we have an input neuron, that's my predictor variable, and an output neuron, that's my response variable. And then here in the gap of the synapse, we have a neurotransmitter that can be released. So it's either a neurotransmitter that sends a signal or a neuroinhibitor that may suppress a signal. And then that gives me an output, that gives me a y variable. So the, the exact mathematical analog is this, y equals a x. And you'll notice I dropped the b here. Uh, that's on purpose, I want to keep the math simple. The B in machine learning jargon is called bias, and I can build that into my neural nets, but I can also scale my data. If I subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, then I don't have to worry about the bias, uh, and that makes all the computation simpler. And in fact, we can build a neural network without bias parameters. That's what we're gonna do, and only just as powerful as a fully fledged one. Okay, let's train our neural network now. And we have a very simple network. Uh, we only have one synapsis that represents one parameter, and we uh, want to figure out what the right value is uh, to fit the data. So my data are the green points here, and I indicated a true slope of 0 0.7. But if I start an untrained network, I usually initialize all the uh, synapses here. They're actually called network weights in machine learning jargon. 
So now I can see we got a value of 0 0.1 here and we want to adjust it so that we have a good fit. So first we actually need a metric that allows us to say how well the network is doing. And we can use a mean square error if you're familiar with statistics. That's just part of a variance calculation. So just to give a numerical example, we could take the first data point here, that's 0.5 and 0.6. So I locate this here, this may be x.5, y.6. And this is my prediction here. So my prediction is ax, so that's this part. I'm just multiplying my current parameter a with 0.5. Then I subtract the actual observation, which is 0.6, which gives me this difference here. Then I square it, so that's my sum of squares. And if I do this for all of my observations and divide by n, then I have my mean square error. And this may look a little tedious to do, but this is actually a good opportunity to talk for a moment about matrix algebra. I can calculate that loss function with matrix algebra, so the computer can do this very fast. So if I were to implement this in R, I would, from my data table, extract uh, the vector x, so this is this column, and the vector y, which is that column. Then I can do a matrix multiplication, or in this case a vector multiplication. So I calculate my differences here, and then I, I transpose it from vertical to horizontal. And then if I multiply the matrix by itself, it spits out the mean square error. So that's something I can do repeatedly very fast, and that's exactly what the algorithm does. So we've seen it before in machine learning. We just vary this value here in a random direction by a little step. Let's say we raise this to 0.2, and then we recalculate this and see if the mean square error gets better or not. If it gets better, then we keep going in that direction. Uh, if it gets worse, then we change direction. But this is not super efficient. So this little neural net here kind of stumbles around in the dark with uh, little steps and tries to make things better. So unfortunately, it doesn't have a brain like us. You know, we could look at the plot and say, well, we should take a big step recalculate the error and then maybe take a few more little steps to optimize it and we'd be done. So our two neurons here can't do that. Or can they? So this brings us to back propagation and gradient descent. And you know that really is the secret sauce of the power of neural networks. And it was actually invented by a master's students in the 1960s in Finland. Um, and also the neural networks, they've been around forever. But nobody put these two together until the early 2000s. So Geoffrey Hinton at the University of Toronto figured out that these two belong together. And uh, that really kicked off the AI revolution. So his graduate students, one of them is now the chief scientist uh, developing ChatGPT at OpenAI, and another student of his, Andrew Karpathy, he led Tesla's research unit to develop self-driving. This is a very, very potent recipe here. So let's see how it works. So let's start with gradient descent. So rather than stumbling around in the dark, we can use calculus to take big steps. And I don't know what you remember from calculus, but if you remember anything, uh, it's usually this one here. So we start with an equation y equals x squared, which is a parabola. That's a classic example. And then I take the first derivative of it, and that happens to be 2x. And the rule for this is just to put whatever's the power in front of the x. And what that represents is the slope of that equation. So that particular equation is actually a parabola with a low point at 0, 0. You can see that that makes sense. If I have negative x values and plug them in, uh, they would be negative slopes. If I have positive values, they would be positive slopes. And if I'm at 0, 2 times 0, my slope is 0. So that can help me figure out where my function has a minimum. And that's exactly what we want, right? So we want this for our error. We want to minimize our mean square error. Now, it's a bit more complicated. So there's a function within a function. We have to apply chain rules. But you can see the same pattern here. So we have the sum of squares. The two migrates down here. And I take a partial derivative with respect to the parameter. So what that derivative means, if, if I increase my parameter a by a very small amount approaching 0, then what is the corresponding change in mean square error? And that's my slope. Now all that's left to do is plug in the numbers, calculate the slope, and obviously I can do this very quickly for the entire data table with matrix algebra. And I get a number minus 1.5, and that's right here, I'm right here, and it means go ahead and take a big step to the right. So that's the information I needed.
So this is what we do in every iteration. We update the parameter. We start with our old value, which was 0 0.1. We want to go to 0 0.7. And essentially what we do is we just subtract the slope multiplied by a learning rate. So the learning rate uh, determines the step size overall, but it is mostly driven by the value. So we said it was a minus 1.5. That's a pretty big value. Now we don't want to overstep. So the learning rate helps us to calibrate the overall step size. So in this case, if we multiply those two, we get a 0.15 increase and our next value is 0.25. I take a big step at first and then subsequently my, my slopes get smaller and my steps get smaller and I arrive at the minimum very quickly, very efficiently. And that's our first Lego brick. So we now have two little neurons that can learn something very, very fast. So we're now developing our Lego block two. And that's the math that we need to process more than one piece of information at the same time. So we may have a situation where we have two input variables, x1 and x2, that determine an outcome. And that is equivalent to a multiple regression problem with two parameters. And again, to make the math simple, I scale the data. So I subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, as so we don't have to worry about the b parameter. So now the job is to simultaneously optimize two parameters to fit the data. So that may be a little bit tricky because I have to kind of deal with two things at the same time. And one influences the other, of course. So let's see how we do this. It is essentially a 2D gradient descent. So we have to figure out the slopes in two dimensions. And um, this is the old formula from the previous example, 1D, that we just talked about. So that's my derivative. And if I expand it to two dimensions, actually as simple as this, so it's just like the multiple regression equation, I'm just adding a to x2, and that same thing happens in my derivative. But now I have to take two different derivatives, so a partial derivative with respect to a1 and a partial derivative with respect to a2. So that one we already calculated, so we're, we're trying to arrive at 0.7. But we now have a second dimension. We have to ask how big a step should I take in that direction. And if I plug in the numbers, that gives me a 0.8. And so I can see that to efficiently arrive at the minimum in two dimension, I should take a slightly larger step in this direction than in that direction. And that makes sense because I'm actually closer to my true value. And then I do the same thing. I update my weights. So my new weight is the old weight minus the slope. But because the slope can be big, we scale that by a learning rate. And I have to obviously calculate that separately for my two weights because they each need their individual adjustment. So now, could we do this in 3D? So no problem, you can just add a3x3 here. Um, could I do it in 12,544 dimensions if I have a big network? It's really not a problem, right? So we'll just plug this in and matrix algebra does the job for us. So we can't visualize it anymore because it has so many dimensions, but uh, you know, you took this multivariate class in order to find solution, we don't necessarily need to visualize it. So that's our second Lego brick that uh, allows us to update weights in a big neural network. So our next Lego brick that we need allows us to deal with nonlinear relationships. You know that some of the time the data is linear, but there are many cause-effect relationships that are actually not linear. So we need some mathematical tools to deal with it, and we just use a nonlinear function. So I'm giving you an example here for a nonlinear function which, which has a sigmoidal shape. So this is actually a formula with four parameters. You can see them here. So where's my inflection point on the x-axis, and which values does the function approach at the top and the bottom? But to keep the math simple, we just set them to 1 and 0. So that's just another simplification that allows us to fit the data efficiently. Um, so all we worry about is a single parameter here, and that determines the steepness of my relationship between my x variable and my y variable. So just as before, I have to take the derivative of that function in order to plug it into my loss function. And it looks pretty simple here, but if you Google how to do a derivative of the sigmoid, uh, equation. That is really something. So it is. it goes on for pages, but then in the end it really simplifies to this. So this is very nice. And we can plug that into our mean square error formula. So instead of a linear relationship, we now have a sigmoidal relationship. 
And now that really gets a little bit messy because we now have to take the derivative of a function of a function of a function. We obviously don't have to go through this process, but you can still see the general pattern uh, to make this intuitively plausible. And once I have this equation, I can just plug in my data table with n rows, right? So I have to go through my entire data table from the beginning to the end. It could be a very large data table. But again, matrix algebra can help us here and we very quickly get the derivative that we need for gradient descent. So this is how the gradient descent looks like. It's actually not a parabola. And I think uh, that also makes intuitive sense because these curves flatten out at the top and at the bottom. If I change my A parameter down here, not much happens. Uh, same at the other end. Um, this is fairly flat, my response. But then in between those two flat parts, there will be a minimum where my curve optimally fits the data. So these yellow lines are alternatives for A, and the green line is where we want to go. And if I look at a plot of my loss function, then you can see we calculated parameter 0.8. So this time I take a step to the left. So if I subtract my slope, which is a positive value, I reduce A. And that's exactly what I want to walk toward that minimum. So can we do this in 2D or in 12,544 I think so, right? It would be exactly the same thing as we saw in the linear case. So in that case, I would have a 2D loss function and then a 3D, 4D that I can't imagine. But I do my gradient descent in multivariate space toward that minimum. Uh, that is fairly straightforward. Okay, so now you might ask, what if my x and y variable don't have a sigmoidal relationship? And uh, the answer to this, amazingly, is it absolutely doesn't matter. As long as I introduce some nonlinear function into my neural network, it can handle any relationship. And this should make sense to you if you remember the lecture on regression trees, right? Because we had a discontinuity, which was a decision tree. So if x was larger than something, go right. If x was smaller than that value, go left. You can use this multiple decisions to fit any function of any shape. And so the exact same thing applies here with the neural networks. And because I can use any discontinuity, uh, people have actually come up with something that is quite clever. That's a rectilinear new unit. So it just has a discontinuity. X is the maximum value of either 0 or x. If x is negative, I make it 0. And if it's positive, then it just stays what it is. So that is a very, very simple nonlinearity. Also has a really simple derivative. So because my slope is 0, and then if it's larger than 0, my slope is 1. So super simple for the computer to calculate the loss function derivative and do a very fast gradient descent. So it's computationally very efficient. So it has another advantage that's called sparse activation. So what I'm effectively doing is I'm silencing everything that has negative values. And if you want an analogy that gets rid of a lot of noise in your brain, and that may help you focus on the things that are important. So it also has disadvantages. So it has an inferior squishification effect. That's actually a technical term. So it prevents neurons from getting overloaded. Um, so you see, this is open-ended. If I have a lot of active big signals coming in, my neuron may get very high values. Uh, that is not necessarily ideal. And it's also not good for probability outputs between 0 and 1. So if I want to calculate the probability of this particular object being a boat or a human or something else, that is not optimal. So in this case, a sigmoidal function will work better because it always gives you outputs between 0 and 1, and the probabilities are also between 0 and 1 that you ultimately want. So I'm, I'm not going to walk you through the to the ReLU loss function, but if your life depends on it, could you figure it out? Probably. Just Google it, right? So this is not different from what you already know in principle. Okay, then let's move on to our next uh, Lego block. So that's our next mathematical tool that we need to build a proper neural network. And so far, we only had input and output neurons, but nothing in between. But obviously, if we want to do anything of complexity, you need these hidden layers of neurons. So I only put one here to illustrate the math, but that's where the name deep neural network comes from. So you have many hidden layers that are all chained up and connected to each other. And the idea of having those hidden layers is that where all the fancy processing takes place. So your output neuron, you can think of it as your consciousness. Your input neuron is the sensory information. So maybe I started the visual cortex, and then I have 
a hidden layer that does edge detection and then another hidden layer that distinguishes shapes and so on and so forth and then in the end something lights up and you recognize oh that's my friend that i haven't seen for 10 years so that's the kind of architecture that we need to build and um, i'm changing the notation here a little bit because before we always looked at functions so i called them a1 and a2 for the parameters in those functions now I'm calling them weight one and weight two. So those are network weights. So these are synonyms. It's exactly the same thing. So if I want to, uh, so if I want to do an efficient gradient descent, I sort of have to trace back how everything is related, and that's called backpropagation. That's the second ingredient of the secret sauce to neural networks, and we'll do it for linear relationships just to keep the math simple. So my objective here is to explain the principle. So it's pretty easy. H, that's the hidden neuron, gets activated by the first weight times the x input and then my second step is to look at the value of the hidden neuron multiplied by the second weight and then I can substitute and I get a simple equation y equals weight 1 times weight 2 times x so obviously that doesn't make a lot of practical sense bear with me this is simply to illustrate the principle so really what I do is I follow whatever happens in my neural network and so what we're doing here is the same thing what we've done before with inner layer, right? So before we combined different weights that came from the same column of neurons. So in those loss functions, we line up our weights vertically, but then we also need a loop that processes them horizontally. So and that we do in a stepwise process, but in principle, it's all the same idea. So I, I have to do all the partial derivatives for the different weights. I think we're almost ready for action. So I have one last Lego block here for you. And um, that deals with multiple dependent variables. So you don't always have multiple dependent variables, but in some cases you do. And let me give you a couple of examples. Going back to the self-driving example, I may have four camera feeds. And then as output variables, I may have steering input, acceleration, and brake input. Now, it doesn't make sense to build separate networks for these dependent variables, right? You don't want to end up in a situation where you do a sharp right, hit full throttle, and slam on the brakes at the same time. So this all needs to be well coordinated by the same network. So another example that we want to solve in the lab later on is um, that you have multiple environmental variables, uh, mean annual temperature, mean annual precipitation, dryness, and extreme heat variables. And you wonder how these affect ecosystem composition under climate change. So there are many moving parts. Each of the species responds to this in their own way, and they're also all interconnected. So a neural network is quite suitable to model this kind of thing. And another case that's very common is that your output variable is actually a class variable. And again, it's not efficient to build separate neural networks for each class type, whatever that may be, a cat, a dog, a human, a car, and so on. And so the very simplest example is a binary classifier. And by now, you know, I like the simple examples that actually also works for my ecological example. I could ask, given all these inputs, what is the probability that a species is present or absent? So lots of data comes in binary format, dead or alive, male or female, immune or susceptible, infected or not. So these binary responses I have to encode. The way I do it is with one hot encoding. That's what it's called. So I have an output neuron for presence and an output neuron for absence. And if it's present, I want the first one to light up. If it's absent, I want the second one to light up. But I can expand this one hot encoding to any number of classes. So this one here would be of type P. So what I want here in my output neurons are actually probabilities, but that's not necessarily what you get. So the network can output negative value or it can have values that are larger than one. So you have to convert this to a probability. And what you use to do this is a, a softmax function. So this is e to the power of whatever value in the first neuron divided by e to the power of all the neurons. That gives me values that actually sum up to one regardless of the input values that you throw at it. So the e, e to the power of x function, in this case, it's e to the power of y, approaches zero for large negative values, and then it sort of takes off in an exponential fashion. So that also means that it forces the network a little bit to be decisive, and that is actually a desirable property because you want that network to make decisions in the end. Now, I can't use mean square error anymore because probabilities are not the right input for the mean square error. They are not normally distributed because they bump at the one and the zero at the two ends. 
So what I do instead, I calculate a cross entropy loss function. So even though that's a slightly fancy name, it's it's ultra simple. So in order to determine the loss or how good the model is, all you do is you multiply your actual label. So if we look here, we calculate a 0.7 probability for uh, something being present. So I enter this down here, uh, multiply by one, and then the rest actually disappears. So even if even if I have a situation with many values, the only log the computer has to take is for a neuron that corresponds to the correct class. And that's it. And if I take the derivative of the loss function, that is actually even simpler. So if I change the probability just a little bit, what's the gradient of my loss that miraculously resolves to just the softmax probability minus the actual value, and that's it. So I don't really have to even calculate the logs unless I want to keep track of my training progress. So now you really have all the pieces that are needed to build almost any kind of neural network architecture so even modern large language models or whatever else is out there, convolutional networks, they don't have any other building blocks than what I explained. So you now really know how these things work. Okay, so to wrap this up, let's now go back to where we started and see if we can fully understand the code that powers these neural networks. So let's import our familiar database. And we can take a look at the first six rows and six columns. We have our labels and the pixels lined up, just as I explained to you before. Um, this is actually a standard data table and how most environmental scientists have their data organized. So you organize your data with observations in rows and variables in columns. So this is my Y variable that I want to predict, and those are my X variables. Now, just for you to see what's behind it, we can actually pick one of these images, so we're picking the third row here, that's uh, supposed to be a four, and we can quickly visualize this. So we have to put this into a matrix, and then we can look at it. So each of the rows contains an image like this. So next we split our labels and the pixels, so X and Y. So now we just have pixels in our X data set, and the label we have to one hot encode, right? We have 10 classes, and we can express this as ones and zero so the computer can understand it. So for my third image that we just looked at, the label is a four. Um, so we're using the sigmoid squishification because we want probabilities for what the pixels represent. Um, so we have to define our sigmoid. We have to create a derivative for the back propagation. And for the last step, we need a softmax that will convert the raw neural activation to a probability between zero and one. So next we define our network, and that is actually also something very simple. We don't initially need variables for our neurons. So if we have a simple architecture like this one, all we need to define are the connections. To connect the first layer to the second, we need 784 pixels times minus 16 processing neurons. And then we need to connect the 16 processing neurons to the 10 output neurons. That's all we need, and now we can train our network. So we need to define a learning rate and also a batch size and epochs. Well, I haven't mentioned this before, but doing matrix algebra on your entire input database, that usually doesn't work. I think with 60,000 images, we could probably do it, but the standard is that you just divide it into small batches and then you do all the calculations on the 32 images and then you, you update your weights and then you fetch the next 32 images. So if you do it like that, you don't have a perfect gradient descent because there's some stochastic element in it. So I'm only looking at 32 images. You take sort of a windy path into the valley. So it's called a stochastic gradient descent. And so epochs is how many times we go through the entire database. So once I'm through with the 60,000 images, I can do it again and that will improve my model further. All right, let's go through our loops here. So we have one for the epochs, how many times we go through the data set, one for the batch size, we just subset the current batch size, call this X and Y. Then my first activation, we just multiply all our pixels by the weights. So because it's not just a single neuron that we're dealing with here, uh, this is done with matrix algebra. This is indicated by the multiplier between the percentage signs. So this multiplies tables essentially. 32 images times 784 pixels 
times 16 hidden layers. So that one line represents around 400,000 multiplications. Then I apply my sigmoid squishification. The next step is the output layer activation. Also nothing new, so there's a hidden layer times the second set of weights. And lastly, I apply my softmax to the output layer and that completes the forward pass through the network, right? So now, in order to adjust my weights, I have to do the backpropagation of the derivatives. So I calculate my loss function, which, as I mentioned before, miraculously simplifies to just, just this. And then I have to take my partial derivatives, calculate the slopes for each weight, and finally update the weights. So the new weights are the old weights minus the slope times the learning rate so that we don't overstep. And at the end of each batch of 32 images, I do want to calculate the cross entropy loss function. We only have to take the log once, this is not going to slow us down, and we'll flash it out of the loop so that we can see it while it's running. So let's try this. I'm just going to highlight the whole section here and hit run and hope for the best. So I can't get over how fast it goes through that database. And it's done. And now we could run this loop again and it would improve the model. So you can do this as many times as you like and take breaks or change your training data. Then finally, once you're satisfied, you can make predictions. So we do this here on an independent test data set. Those are images that the network has never seen before. So we have to do the same data prep. So this time we just do a single forward pass through the network. So this code here is exactly the same as this forward pass here. So we're just running pixels through the network to get an output probability. And then I simply ask which one has the highest probability. And I check whether that is the same as the human label. So let's run this bit. And there we go. So we get to about 95% with 16 neurons. But really nothing can stop you from having a couple of million neurons if you like to tackle bigger problems. So that's it. And you are now ready uh, to do lab number nine where you can play with this code, maybe build a slightly more complex network architecture or make it do different things. So we don't want to necessarily classify images, but you can use it to predict anything.